introduce uh, Jeremy Mill, and uh, he's talking on reversing and bypassing DRM and HSM dongles. So, Jeremy Mill, take it away. Hey everyone, uh, yeah, so this is my talk on reversing and bypassing dongle-based DRM systems. Um, so who am I? Uh, I'm a security engineer. I work in vertical transportation here in Connecticut. Um, it's only a couple of those companies. Uh, I work mostly in AppSec, right? So I work with our development teams uh, trying to make sure that the products that we produce are ready to go and be out in the world and, you know, kind of all over the world. Uh, but 80% of the blue team working secure architecture, uh, code reviews, that kind of thing. But about 20% uh, of the time, I get to, you know, kind of put my my black hat on and do some red team stuff, testing uh, some some vendor supplied products or products that we produce, uh, which I guess makes me on the uh, dark medium violet team. Because uh, we're we're all about adding extra colors. So so dongles, right? Um, I imagine most of the people in this room, in most of your industries, um, think that dongles are pretty much dead. You probably don't deal with them on any kind of frequent basis. Um, but they still exist, and they're still out there, and there's a couple of reasons why. Um, the first is that there, there's lots of systems that are offline, um, especially in the defense industry. Um, there are air gap systems. Um, in my industry, there's a lot of remote sites, right, places where internet connectivity isn't a given, right? Um, 2G cell access isn't even a given, right? So uh, companies still have a need to want to enforce uh, DRM, um, whether that's for licensing, right? Making sure that they're getting the money that's owed to them uh, by their clients, or uh, if it's the protection of intellectual property, right? Protecting against um, you know industrial espionage and things like that. There's also legacy products. Um, I, I imagine lots of people here who work in the industry know that legacy is incredibly hard to kill. So something might have been produced 15, 20 years ago that used a dongle-based uh, DRM system. It's still there. It's still kicking around. It's probably not going anywhere in the next five to 10 years either. Uh, so the one that happened across my desk um, is made by a company called Secutech, and they make something called the Unikey. Um, and it comes in a couple different uh, flavors. There's the standard, right, where um, you know, this thing basically just has a microcontroller on it, um, where you can store some on-dongle instructions on there. Um, you can store some encryption keys. There are uh, some license modules on there, right? This is how you control what features of an application are on there, how many times it can launch, things like that. Uh, there's also a random number generator. There's also the Unikey Time, which takes all of those same features and adds a real-time clock and a battery on there, right? So now you can't just change the time on your server and look, you're licensed again. Um, and then there's the Unikey Drive, which takes all those same standards, but it also adds uh, like some read-only storage to it, some CD-ROM emulation, um, and it also adds uh, some RSA functionality, uh, signing, encrypting, decrypting, uh, things like that. So the one that I had, uh, like I said, came across my desk is the, the Unikey time, and that's, that's the one that I had for doing all of this actual hands-on testing. Um, but all of the libraries that we go through when we're doing this reversing are standard across all of them. So really, this is like a, this is like a product line level of vulnerability. So some of the key features uh, that I investigated, and they're, they're in quotes for a reason, um, the first is the enveloper, right, which is your company has an application, it was developed, it was tested, and now you want to just add DRM to it. Well, they provide something called the enveloper, which is just take that existing application, shove it into this tool, it's going to spit you out a protected executable with DRM functionality built into it. Um, also, those dongle stored and executed instructions, this should, in theory, be really hard to reverse without exploiting the hardware. Um, it turns out um, that's not the case, and we'll see why. Uh, licensing modes, right? This is the number of launches, time to expire, features that are available. Um, a, the random number generator is built in there, um, as well as some anti-debug functionality, which they claim is robust, um, and uh, some ability to encrypt and decrypt buffers. So the authentication system for the Unikey. Um, there's, there's, two, there's a two-password scheme. The first is uh, a user password, right? This is essentially a, a read-only user, and it's made up of two 16-bit integers. So we have 32 bits 
of uh, password if we're going to try and brute force this. And the second one is an admin password, which means that you need to have those two user passwords as well as the two admin passwords, right? So we've got 64 bits uh, needed to log in, and that gives you read and write functionality. Um, however, some of those functions still aren't directly exposed, um, and we'll see that's actually the, the only part of this that uh, so far we, I haven't been able to, to break. So the first is the enveloper, right? Uh, it takes the application in, and it wraps it. Um, the enveloped app, app um, basically works by checking for the dongle's existence, making sure that that user key that exists can log into the dongle, right? Making sure that there's, there's a match there. Um, and then it's constantly in the background. It spawns a thread, which is just on some random time interval, uh, checking for the existence of that dongle and that the, the login still works. Um, on Windows, it turns out that this is just a really heavily obfuscated .NET executable. So since it's .NET, uh, my, my preferred tool whenever I, I have something in .NET that I'm going to start reversing is dnSpy. Um, and like I said, it's, it's really heavily obfuscated. Um, things are kind of all over the place. Uh, these, these screenshots actually don't do a, a very good job of, of showing um, kind of how spread out things got after it was obfuscated. Um, tools like de for dot didn't really help deobfuscate it. Um, it's really awesome when it does work out that way, because um, you're, you're right back to basically the same executable. Um, so, so we're kind of stuck manually digging our way through it. Um, unfortunately, right, the, the anti-debug functionality that we talked about is, is there. So as I'm trying to step through this and set breakpoints on interesting looking functions, uh, the application keeps crashing. Um, kind of manually digging our way through, we find it to a, a single call to um, unikey.dll. And this function suspend other thread, um, and the crash is happening after this call. So uh, this is not a .NET uh, library, unfortunately. So uh, we're going to change tools, and we're going over to Gidra. Um, luckily, when we're looking for anti-debug functionality, there's only a few places that we can actually, um, you know, where, where you can determine whether or not a debugger is present, and all of them are coming from kernel 32.dll. Um, so we can go to the imports tab, look up, uh, you know, go to all of our imports to, from kernel 32, uh, and we can, hopefully you can see it there, but we can find is debugger present, and um, Gidra's really nice. There's every place where is debugger present is called. Um, so now, literally all we have to do is double click on that, and we're, we move on to our function. You should also notice that for um, this being one of the main features is the anti-debug functionality. This is a small list, right? There is one function call. So um, we move over to that uh, function call, and we see that we have uh, our call here to is debugger present. Uh, you'll see it on the, the decompiled view there. And then we have um, a comparison to whether or not it's equal to zero. Um, which luckily means that the patch for this is going to be really tiny, right? We only have to patch a single instruction, and we've bypassed all of the anti-debug functionality. Um, unfortunately, the only place where Gidra has really choked on me is in patching binaries. So um, I had to move from Gidra to R2 and Cutter, um, and uh, I performed the patch there, and then uh, re-examined it. Right, so we're going we're gonna to patch our jump non zero here, to a jump less than, and all of the anti-debug functionality is gone. So we can go back into dnSpy, and now debugging is a lot easier. We can start tracking. We also know that we're looking for interesting calls to Unikey 32 DLL. That's where all of the, the, the interesting calls to you know, the actual DRM are happening. Um, and so one of the first things that we can find is uh, the first half of our password. Right? This, these are our user keys. Uh, this is going to be really important later for bypassing the rest of the system is the fact that these user keys must be in any application uh, that's going to be using the dongle functionality. We can also extract the AES key. Some things can't be deobfuscated away. It's right there. We can just dump that AES key. And uh, the last piece of this, this is just a NetZ executable, which is short for the... Uh, original executable 
that um, we had, right, that we were attempting to protect. It basically just got put into an encrypted zip functionality uh, included in the .NET assembly, and that's what's being shipped out here with the uh, code to check for the dongle. So that's been covered in a bunch of other places. If you Google dumping NetZ executables, uh, you'll, you'll find it in about three seconds. It's a, it's a really trivial task. So uh, kind of like we said, right, that was easy enough. Unfortunately, the vendor even says that that's easy enough, which is surprising for one of their core uh, claims for their marketing, right? Uh, they say, you know, this is from their documentation, please do not only check if the Unikey dongle exists, right? If the dongle's attached, this form of protection is extremely easy to crack. It was. Um, they say the real value add is, and again, this is in their words from their documentation, uh, in the random number generation, which is based off of the vendor seed value, uh, securely reading and checking the license modules, those license modules that, that we talked about. Um, only, uh, you can't directly read the value out of this as a user. You can only kind of check whether or not the, the value that you passed in is valid. Um, but admins can write new values to these modules. Um, or in performing unusual mathematical algorithms, right? These are those dongle-based uh, instructions that we talked about. Um, and viewing and editing those requires the, the full password, right, which requires the, admin, the vendor seed value to get. They also say the password generation algorithm is irreversible. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, cl clearly we, we need that vendor seed value, right? That's, that's the keys to the kingdom here. Um, and if we've compromised that, we've compromised pretty much everything that, that you could do with this, all of their core claims over protecting that value. So there's, there's two obvious places to start, right? The first is we can check where it's consumed, right? When you go to perform an admin action. Uh, the other place that would make sense is where that vendor seed value gets turned into four passwords, right? That's not a, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. There's some kind of, there's some kind of math that's happening there, right? Um, the, the password consumption API is non-trivial, right? There's a lot of weirdness going on with uh, random values based off of uh, the current system time, and I'm lazy, so uh, I'm not doing that one. But the API for where that seed is turned into passwords looks far less complex, so that's where I focused my time. So we're, we're back into Gidra, and the method that we're looking for from their documentation is the unikey generate new password method. Right, which is where we pass in a 32-bit vendor seed value. Now, um, if you are somebody who's involved with cryptography quite a bit, um, alarm bell should already be going off in your head. Somehow, 32 bits of value is becoming 64 bits of password. There's only a couple of ways to do that kind of key expansion, right? Um, and the, even less of them to do it securely and they did not choose any of those. <laughs> so we end up in this block of code. Um, so if, you're, if you take a look at it, some things should already start to jump out for you. Primarily, should be that MD5 piece of things. Um, so basically, what, what's happening here is you're just passing in that 32-bit seed value. You're passing it into MD5 and you're, you're taking its digest. That's your mathematically slow operation of this whole thing. That's it. I mean, it's sort of it. There's also some weird math that happens on the digest, right? They do some like rotation of this hash. That way it's not just uh, uh, an MD5 hash. I think this is how they made themselves feel better at night. Um, I really genuinely don't know what this block of code is doing. I also genuinely don't care um, because Gidra so far, especially with ARM, right, they provide a whole bunch of libraries compiled for a whole bunch of things, so I actually got to pick and choose what decompiled more nicely. Um, Gidra for ARM is like really good um, and very, very close to what the original uh, values would be. So I literally took this and copied it. Um, and then finally after that, that weird math function, um, we're just taking the bottom 64 bits of that hash plus that weird math, and those are our passwords. So kind of to sum up what we've got to this point, right, is we have a 32-bit input expanded to 128 bits by MD5. 
some computationally not important uh, obfuscation of the fact that it's just an MD5 hash, right? Then we are only using the bottom 64 bits of it. And this is the really important piece. We have an oracle for what the likely inputs are. We have an oracle because we have to have the bottom 32 bits of that. That's our user password. So we can brute force this without needing to do anything fancy, right? This isn't uh, going to require a GPU cluster. We're not going to go over to AWS and go rent some GPUs. I'm just going to use my laptop. So I did, and there's a proof of concept out there that you can go and grab. Um, I, I wrote it in Rust because Rust is awesome. Um, if any of you deal with CVEs on a daily basis and you see how many of them come from C and memory, um, you should also love Rust. That's my, my little plug. Um, but the, uh, the end state of this is you can brute force the entire key space in about 10 minutes on a reasonably powerful laptop. Um, and what you can see from this output is uh, I gave it two um, user seed values. And I think this one took about six minutes. It spit out what the admin seed values are as well as what the original vendor seed was. So now, with just that, and using a tool that they provide for free called their console, right, we can dump the instructions that are on the dongle, right, those things that should have required us to compromise the hardware, right, are just displayed and we can take them and copy them and do whatever we want with them or change them, right, and just say, oh, uh, you're just return zero now. That was easy. Um, we can predict the output of the dongle-based random number generator. Um, if the software that's using this was relying on that random number generator to do anything, especially if it was cryptographic, um, it was probably owned anyway because uh, this, is, this is bad. Um, you can also change those licensing mod modes and the time-based expiration values. So, um, you know, you're licensed for all of the features forever. Um, you can dump or change the dongle's memory. Um, and you can change the dongle encryption keys, but you can't view them. Um, so you can change those keys, but you'll, you'll lose any of the old data that was encrypted by it. Um, so kind of that's, that's bad enough, right? We bypassed it without doing, using any of the expanded functionality that was available to us um, by the vendor. Um, but there is an additional feature they provide. And that additional feature is um, the ability to remotely update someone's uh, software, right? So let's imagine that the brute force didn't work, right? They, they provide this remote update utility. And what you do is you take the updated data that you want to store in the dongle, right? Whether that's um, an update to the dongle's memory, an update to the licensing modules, or uh, you know an anything else that it stores, and um, you produce an update file. And there's an optional password on here, which is going to uh, do some encryption for us of that file, which also doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense, because uh, you're about to give that password to the user who's required to use it in order to update their dongle. So I'm not quite sure who that encryption is protecting against, but it's there. Um, so then the user runs the updater or some, or you use the library that they provided uh, to, to interface with that update file and um, the, the dongle is updated, right? That, that Unikey is updated. But that's a write operation, right? Write operations require the admin password. Also correct. It, it can't just be in there, can it? Yes, it can. Um, yeah, so long story short, this is an INI file that has um, been kind of minorly obfuscated and gets parsed. It's also potentially encrypted, um, but they provide on their website the libraries. So reverse engineering the weird XOR obfuscation that they did of this file in order to just take an update file that they gave you and reverse engineer it is just really, really easy. Um, so I didn't, I didn't build a proof of concept for this um, because I kind of tackled this piece of it later on. Um, but it's really trivial to do. And as soon as, as uh, anybody's gone and, and done it, um, 
you, you have the vendor passwords because they supplied them to you. Um, so about that password protection, right? They do provide it, right? That should add some level of functionality other than the fact that they're going to give you the password for it. Um, but even if you didn't, right? Even if we were trying to... I think so. They were upset. <laughs> I tried to work the word dongle as many times into this presentation as I could. <laughs> yeah, just try turning that back on. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Apparently the projector was uh, on for too long. <laughs> Quick replay for everybody who came in late. Yeah, so um, about that password protection, right? Um, it turns out that they are, they kind of follow a familiar pattern here, right? Of not really understanding how to do uh, key expansion or key derivation. Um, they follow that exact same scheme, uh, which is taking in the password, running it through MD5, and using that as a, a generation into AES. So there are other definite cryptographic attacks here. Um, in, even in the case where you're trying to prevent, you know, the, the use case where this update file is intercepted in transit, right? Um, cracking it, MD5 just isn't, isn't suitable for that task. Um, to make matters worse, that update file, they also don't really understand how to use AES. Um, it's in ECB mode. Um, which means that especially in the case where uh, one of those key features that you're doing is updating that dongle memory, right? Um, we should be able to play pick and choose um, with blocks of memory and repeat them, right? So even if we didn't have the ability to crack the vendor seed value, there's other probably very serious cryptographic flaws um, in how this update mechanism is working uh, that sh should result in more serious things than just uh, just a crash of the updater. Um, and for any of you, this is just kind of a public service announcement. Um, yeah, all modes are beautiful, but not ECB. So uh, to sum it up, um, there's a couple things that haven't been broken yet, right? Um, there are four encryption slots that store those four 128-bit keys for us, um, and there's that encrypt and decrypt buffer API. Um, however, that isn't even AES being used in the case of that, right? And it kind of makes sense because this is a really tiny, cheap microcontroller that was developed uh, probably not in the past 10 years, probably older than that, which drove their decision to, to use T, the tiny encryption algorithm. But it is also an ECB mode. So even if you do have some set of values that are uh, you know, encrypted by a key, right? There are, um, you know, depending on how they're used, right? Like any other crypto mode, um, it, there could be very serious issues with it. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, right, T isn't explicitly broken. Um, the best case is a 2 to the 126 uh, base attack, which means that um, 
for any encrypted block, there are three possible passwords for decrypting it. That's still well above probably anybody that's in this room, unless you're working for the NSA, in which case we should talk. Uh, but probably not going to be the way. I haven't found a way to dump these keys yet. Um, that being said, I've, I've recently um, kind of continuing research. Uh, I took this thing apart. There's an exposed UART that's, that's exposed on the board um, that I, I've started playing around with. It has some non-trivial API. Um, so uh, I'm hoping to continue to break this. Uh, additionally, it looks like there's a lot of user side checking when you perform the read dongle memory on those bounds. Um, I'm also hopeful that um, kind of uh, continuing reversing this, uh, we'll find a way to just dump all of the firmware from the dongle because then we can find all sorts of other fun things. Um, so I think it's important to add a time frame to this, right? Especially um, there were some people who this was their first B-sides and I know it certainly um, was the case for me, which is uh, you kind of get that feeling when you're watching something that someone just sat down and hacked this out uh, maybe there are people in this room who could do that, but it is not me. Um, dumping of the enveloped app was probably about like two days of man hours, but I'm also really familiar with reversing .NET executables. Um, so I had a, a, a step forward there. I'd also already seen NetZ executables in, in that kind of storage. So dumping that piece of it was, was really pretty trivial. Um, Reversing and creating the seed exploit um, was a few weeks worth of work. Um, this was on and off, um, but that includes a lot of other time spent on failed exploitation paths um, and trying to find other exploits that may have been here. I actually kind of thought things would be harder than they were um, to, to reverse that vendor seed value because I was looking at where they were consumed for a while. I also spent some time trying to find out um, exactly how they were. Um, there's no explicit replay attack that's available, um, just sniffing the, the USB bus between the PC and the dongle, like there are on um, some other very large manufacturers, right? So you can just create a virtual USB drive and um, launch the application once, and then you have a replay attack, and you're done. Um, so yeah, I spent, spent a lot of other time on that. Um, this should be reversible in, in future work. I'm probably mostly done with the Unikey, but if you're interested, um, it's, it's just a random value based off of the current time and some other uh, weird obfuscation. So uh, the conclusions, um, running your crypto on someone else's machine doesn't work, right? It, it hasn't worked for like literally anybody. Um, it hasn't worked for the HDMI standard. It didn't work with DVDs. It hasn't worked with DRM systems up until now. So you, there, there is a, there is a, a drive from the upper levels of business, especially those who may not be very familiar with the work it is that we're doing to try and get you to perform DRM. And it's really hard to explain that somebody probably put more work into integrating the unit, integrating the Unikey into their application to prevent um, things being stolen, right? Than it did for me to crack it. Um, and that's you know that's just that's a lot of wasted time um, on something that if there's a dedicated attacker who's attempting to do this, they're just going to do. Um, so yeah, DRM is hard. Offline DRM is even harder, right? Because you control everything. You control the full piece of this, right, which is like with the other DRM systems um, and just replaying over a USB bus. Uh, it's a lot harder to do when it's your server on the other side in your data center. Um, and I guess the last thing is don't use MD5. Most of you should know that already, but just in case, don't. Uh, and especially don't use it for key derivation. Um, and also don't use ECB mode. That's just my, my public service piece of that. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, are they still being sold? Uh, the question was, are they still being sold? Yes, they are. Uh, they're like $40 a pop or something like that. And it, they're not always explicitly branded as Unikeys. Um, one of the things that they offer, right, is, is reskinning them and, and having your company's name on the outside of them and things like that. 
why, what motivates you, or motivated you to do this work? So the question was what motivated me to do this work? Um, the answer to that is that I had a push from higher levels of my organization to try and find out a DRM system that would protect our intellectual property. Um, and so part of that work is taking a vendor solution and finding out whether or not it's worth something, right? It's possible that some company out there is going to figure out DRM, right? Uh, at some point, that will probably be the case. It's just not today and not with what we currently know about crypto. Do they have a bug bounty program? Uh, the question was, do they have a bug bounty program? Uh, no. Uh, and... Uh, this is really just the inherent design of their software. Um, I, I, even if they wanted to fix this, I really think that the only fix for them is to build a different product that would just be broken in some other way. Uh, have you had any interactions with the vendor? Uh, have I had any interactions with the vendor? Uh, I have not. Uh, so this is um, essentially just a, a full disclosure of, of these issues. Could they have made it a lot harder for you to report it instead of having a janky MP5 32-bit MP5? Yeah, the question is, um, uh, could it have been harder uh, to do? Yes, it could have been harder. Um, un unfortunately, right, I imagine that their business requirements are that it needs to be remotely updatable, and it needs to be remotely updatable offline, right? So could it have been harder to brute force? Like, yeah, absolutely. It could have been, uh, you know, PBK DF2 and 10,000 iterations, right? And it would still be running on my laptop from several months ago and my house would be a lot warmer. Um, but um, at the end of the day, right, uh, it needs to be, we need to talk about much larger values. And that also for them probably means a more expensive microcontroller on the other end of it. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you coming.